you know, I think reasonably you can make sure that that runs because that is, like you mentioned, a, a carnival, a well-polished carnival ride. Mm -hmm. uh, roller coasters, I think, are fraught with peril. But if if you're looking at, like, you know what, uh, uh, what they're building now, like the Avatar ride, if you're looking at the... Uh, uh, the, the the Han Solo ride at, at Star Wars. These are things that like are are obviously mechanically leaps and bounds beyond the teacups, but are effectively just hydraulic systems that uh, you have a, a, a great 4K projection in front of. Oh, hold on. I'm sorry. I'm just writing an email to Carnival Cruise Lines. I know you guys already have a roller coaster on your cruise ship, but Justin says it's a dumb idea and you should stop it now. I'm done. <laughs> All right. It's not to say that it, it is again impossible, right? It it's just I I don't know how often that breaks down. I don't know how often it's there for for the business model that they had, which was pull into port. I mean, I'd assume you pull into port with, you know, a, a week or so before you opened, right? Depending on how uh, of long you were open, uh, you'd be able to fix up anything. I mean, I guess it is. We're looking it, at video right now. Oh, just a, our audience of the Bolt roller coaster on board Carnival Cruise Lines. I mean, it is technically a coaster. It looks like. I mean, it's not, you know. Oh, Six that's Flags. the baby coaster. The baby coaster at at uh, at any theme park or carnival. That's the one that that you. Come on, that's only. Oh, I like how you're like. Ah, oh, it's not the. <laughs> can't be done. Well, ah, it's done, but that doesn't count because you know. <laughs> I want a wooden coaster that's a hundred years old. Yeah, I didn't want that. I didn't want that. I, I mean, <laughs> I, I just said that it's fraught with peril. I didn't say it was impossible. Don't put words in my mouth. A, a no, boring coaster, Andrew. Peril. A boring coaster is also peril. Yeah. Yes, and that's really cool because they, they have a very simple coaster that really is there because you're looking out into the ocean, right? Like that's the 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 attraction of that coaster is that it's at the top of the the, the top of the ship, and so you get to see all these really cool views. And that's fun, right? Yeah, and it's carnival with a billion ships, and they're like, hey, what do we want to put on this one? I don't know, like a ball pit filled with eels? Okay, we'll do it. Exactly, right? Now that sounds like, fun. They, yeah. Uh, uh, something something to, to, to differentiate ships. But, uh, you know, with where rides are going, I guess my, my point is, with where rides are going, I could see this more clearly mm. like with, with so much projection when, when, when projection is such a large part of it uh i could i can understand it more than trying to do something with the throughput of like a space mountain on there yeah that makes more yeah. sense for these sort of enclosed smaller rides um or like well, attractions like a teacup or but I could see if they were using things like the Omni Movers, and you had something as big as an oil tanker, which, uh, just for point of reference, was able to hold King Kong. Um, you have a lot of space yeah. inside of there, and you could do something. You know, I don't know what the actual interior space like. Is it like warehouse size or whatever? Like, I, I mean, I love. I, I think ultimately it would just be the operations and the upkeep would be colossally expensive to be able to do this and maintain this. I would see this as a thing that sounds like a neat idea, but all of the things that you pointed out, I think you're hundred percent right as far as the, what makes it problematic and trying to the moving everybody around versus what kind of revenue you're making versus, you know, what they eventually did with the actual Disney cruise ships where it's like, Hey, let's charge people a lot of money per day to stay yeah. on the ship. And then, mm -hmm you know, work from there and, and add cool attractions. And if you look at the Disney cruise lines now and you see what they have on there, if you're a kid, like it's pretty amazing. You know, they have like, you know, whole star Wars sections and Marvel sections and, you know, all kinds of cool interactive things throughout the ship. They do, they do, like I said before, they'll do the firework shows <laughs> from the ship. So. Yeah. I think it, it's, it's an interesting idea. There is an element of it that I really do love. I do love the idea of, you know, Disney. Walt obviously wanted to take the county fair idea and and elevate it to high art. And that's what theme parks are. That's what Disney had pioneered. That's what, uh, you know, his, his legacy is. I do love the idea of then taking that and saying, okay, but 
what's our traveling version of this? Like what makes it so special that you remember it for the rest of your life the day that Disney mm-hmm. came to town? Right. Uh, you, you know, that that is fascinating. And I, I can I can see where they wanted to do it. Uh, but I can also understand that at a certain point that balance sheet has to look terrifying. I I almost wonder if I mean this is getting away from the original idea, but if they just did a pop up Disney thing on land or at port, like in port cities, where they can they can haul it around via ship and they can do big, uh, big big attractions, whether it's things like the Omni Mover rides or what have you, um, and so they're like in, uh, hey Disney's in 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 Seattle for a week. You know, there there certainly could be... What's that? Does that dilute the idea of going to Disney? I think it. Ha- I think they could do a a form of a Disney experience. Like they have like what's like there's like some company does like the big Marvel Expo sort of thing, and and there's been those sort of events. And I could see, and I don't know how successful those have been, but I could see. And that's an event where they have like stunts and stuff and all that, and they take over like a local arena and they do that. And that's not. Disney per se, and even like the Disney live shows are produced. I think they're produced by Feld still or whoever. But I could certainly see if Disney says, "Hey, there's money here. This is a market we think is going to have a future 20 years from now. Let's create an experience." And it might be like, "Oh, well, we're going to go do. We're going to do the the Frozen Land. We're going to put Frozen in Miami. You know, for like like Cirque du Soleil does. You know, like when they do they do an installation stuff." So I could see that, you know, and it, you'd, you would want to make it a different kind of experience, I think. But mm. anything's possible. You know, we've talked a bit before about Disney Quest, which, uh, you know, Justin and I had, you know, been able to go to in Orlando, which was a neat idea, but, you know, had its own limitations as far as throughput. Uh, we want to take a comment from the the chat. Was, uh, was it Mantuba or whatever was asking about, yeah. like, do you think with these floating ships and cities that they might become their own kind of like countries or something to that effect it's scrolled out of view so i'm paraphrasing uh, yeah matuba says do you think that these floating cities will soon just become actual cities one day with their own laws and regulations maybe when water world happens <laughs> i mean uh if, if 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 peter Thiel has his way right or any, any of the other uh, seasteading yeah. movement Silicon yeah, Valley the, really the... wants this they want they they keep Saying, saying that they want lawless lands where they can give their employees Adderall. <laughs> that's, that's, that wasn't a different brochure than I saw. But probably is. <laughs> I mean, and, and by the and, and by the way, Bryce, uh, 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 living in the Bay Area, the employees need no direction on that second. No, but uh, I'm, like I, every time I hear like, oh, we need a space where we don't have to like abide by the Food and Drug Administration, and like. The 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 uh, ATF or whatever it just makes me think. Well, they just want to raise weed and be allowed to get, to hand out Adderall at the at the Monday meetings. At Google. Yeah, I, well, some of it is more like if you look at Freedom Ship and stuff like that. It's more like just a bunch of wealthy people want to kind of go live on this sort of thing and say you know f you to the world and be in their own sort of environment um, and be kind of live sort of totally free. Having lived on a cruise ship, um, let me tell you what, uh, there are a lot of trade-offs. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I think that I think these ideas are interesting, but the problem is, is that whenever you see a ship, you look at this sort of self-contained thing, like ah, there's the ship, ah, you're set at sea. Well, you're bringing in tons. You have to have tons of food on board. You know, when you're on a, when you actually live on a ship or work on a ship, you see how much it takes to maintain that ship from every port you go to. All the logistics of getting food, everything you need to the ship, people inboard, onboard, off, whatever. If there's bad weather, having to go to ports and stuff, it's hard to be like the self-sustaining environment on a ship because ships are so hard to maintain. You know, that's the reason we invented ports and stuff is so we could go there and fix these things and load them up. So I would say that the problem is, is if you do this to sort of say, hey, we're going to go be our own world. If other countries aren't on board, it's going to be challenging. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, um, not not to say it's impossible, whatever, but I think you need to have a really good, you know, business purpose to do it. And I could certainly see that, like, you know, when Europe passed their like uh, right to forget law and some of these other things that come in place that affect data, 
you could certainly say that like if there was strategic advantages for certain historical data, whatever, what have you. The thing is, is you don't want to do something for a purpose that's so egregious or immoral, like, ah, we're going to give you gambling and illegal porn sort of servers on our ship because you'll get shut down. Somebody will find a rule or a reason, whatever, to do that. But I don't know. I, I, I see all the problems, but I could see that there could be a point where there could be advantageous to it, you know? Yeah, I think we're, we're, we're a few technological breakthroughs away from making, you know, semi-permanent life. Uh, uh, popularly viable. It, obviously, it is viable now, uh, but but to your point, Bryce, it's not about handing out Adderall to your employees. It's it's about not paying taxes. Well, yeah, also. and but it, you the, know, <laughs> like if you if you said something, that's on like, the list. That's I'm also down on the list. I'm like seasteading right now, man. I got I can't wait to get the hell out of here. And they would list a billion different things, and then you said. All right, if you're a representative of the government, you don't have to pay taxes. They'd be like, okay, cool. All right, I'll just stay. That's fine. I just That's really my big thing. Yeah. So another thing to think about, too, is like there's still a lot of islands. You, you, if you buy an island, now if you buy an island, most of your islands are in island chains or in things like this. But if you buy an island, you have a tremendous amount of autonomy because you know before anybody's going to set foot on there. And uh, we have a friend that works with a friend that has a, a, a nice piece of property in the Bahamas, and – They'll get a call when they'll say, oh, yeah, there's a ship. You know, we there's somebody offshore or whatever. There's paparazzi there. There's this. And you'll hear, like, they'll get – the other people on the islands will tell you, like, oh, yeah, there's somebody here or whatever. So that's part of the advantage of that is that you, you're kind of responsible. You are on your own in many ways, you know. So, you know, think, oh, Bryce has already got the list of islands to buy. Yeah, you could get um, uh, the Windmere Island at the Bahamas price upon request. Okay. Mm -hmm. If you have to ask, you can't afford it. Can't afford it. Some of these other mm -hmm. ones did have prices. Uh, the Spectabilis Island in the Bahamas is sixty-two million U.S. dollars. Uh, that's about wow. four hundred and sixty acres. Uh, Twenty-six acres, okay, more reasonable. Ninety-five million dollars for the Pumpkin Key in Florida. Hmm. Um, is that really reasonable? I don't know. <laughs> Wait, where is Pumpkin Key? Uh, in yeah. Florida, know, but but if it if it's near if it's off Jacksonville, that's a ripoff. A <laughs> uh, card sound bay in the Florida Keys near Key Largo. Oh yeah, no, that's prime. That's worth it. Hundred mil, hundred mil to be uh, right off the coast of Key Largo. Yeah. Hell yeah. Oh yeah, that and the thing too is like a lot of these prices like have gone up considerably because you've you've had. Uh, you know, as, as wealth has increased in certain areas, the idea of like, well, where do we go with this? You know, and uh, we could buy the island of Patroclus in Greece, too. Ooh, you know, it's Greece. a good island. That's a good like uh, Thermoscuria. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> um, well, I mean, that's the thing is when you have a lot of really, 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 really rich people, um, there is the, 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 the desire to differentiate yourself from other rich people. It's why rich people love buying sports teams, because there's only so many. Yeah. Oh, yeah, not every not every rich person can own one, and if you own one, now that's the thing. You walk into a room, and it doesn't matter. You can walk in with the president of the United States, and you're the owner of the Cleveland Cavaliers, right? Like, and and that's a thing that is forever for as long as you want to do it, and it's just that that's that's uh, uh, un unfwittable. Yeah. Hey, apparently we can buy Long Island, South Carolina. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I'll tell you what. You can buy yourself a peace of mind if you head on over to patreon.com slash weird things. That's where you can spend your hard-earned money on this podcast. You know, we like to work hard every single week. Well, at least Bryce, uh, uh, Andrew, Andrew and myself. And uh, uh, yeah, you know, uh, we, we're working hard yeah. really right now. You know, Making we're not sure every week you guys get a show. Yeah. In fact, do yourself a favor and uh, go on to the Blizzard app and 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 just uh, see whether or not Brian is live right now. And then just uh, say, hey, uh, the other boys are working real hard. Just feel like you should know. Oh, I and think do I that, can do that. If you're listening to this, uh, if you're if you're listening to this later and you see him on there, just let him know that the boys are working real hard and you're heading right on over to Patreon.com/slash Weird Things and earmarking your pledge to not go to Brian. Uh, uh, so, so please go ahead and, and do that. Just put that little earmark on there and we'll make sure we take care of it. Patreon.com slash weird things. 
trying to see if there's anything within our Patreon budget here. Oh, I guess it. Do- <laughs> I guess it won't let me see his status if I am, if I am logged in as him. Someone needs to do yeah. that, do the heavy work for me and see if he's actually online. Yeah. <laughs> uh. So, uh, man, did we did did we talk about this? How uh, Chinese authorities were upset at a farmer because uh, apparently every time aircraft came near his property, the the guidance systems would be interfered with. All right. Okay. Like, like jamming? And, yeah, like GPS jamming and you know whatnot was happening there, right? Some, some sort of like, weird hey, corn growing weird corn out in in China, huh? It's one of these things where like you're like, oh, this is gonna be interesting. And then uh, then you go, oh wow, wow, China. Um so uh, neither of you heard this story? No. No, I didn't. All right. Great. Um uh I need I need my two uh, two investigators. Uh, your two two Americans hired by the Chinese authorities to find out All right. why. All right. Uh, um, this, I am this... I am I am Jim Jackson and he's Jack Jimson. I'm Jack Jimson. Right. That's right. Both two chewing Americans. Gum. Yeah. Yeah. We're, both, gum. we're Americans. Boy, you know what I love about American uh, America, uh, Jack? Yeah. What is that, Jim? Uh, I love uh, good old U.S. of A. Bald eagles, windswept uh, grain, and and purple mountain majesty. White picket fences, apple pie, purple mountains majesty. All we got them all, baby. Exactly. You know, uh, I, I like freedom and purple mountain majesty and <laughs> and uh, 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 cereal on a cold morning. That's right. Uh, but uh, apparently, we got to go solve some of China's problems. Well, that's what they call in. They they know that the only the only gumshoes that really matter are from America. That's right. Historically, world's famous detectives from America, and so that's why they brought us in. Old Jack uh, Jimson and and Jim, Jim Jackson. Jackson. That's right. So, uh, yeah, guys. Uh, hi, I'm, I'm American too. Um, and uh, I was brought in to help work with the Chinese authorities to do this. The the wonderful open Chinese government is uh, very inclusive, is how we I work here. I try to do the secret American handshake with you. Yeah. Um. So. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Apparently, uh, airplanes come by here. There's the farm over there, and we're trying to figure out why. Uh, why our airplanes are getting jammed? Now, uh, are there any? Uh, 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 along the lands, uh, the the landscape, do we see any like antennas, satellite dishes, maybe um, jammy yeah, shaped we think devices? Farmer, we, think the farmers, we think the farmers doing it. You know, we see some suspicious looking silos and some stuff there. Uh, okay, silos can hide huh? big things, Jack. I mean, Jim. Do you see, uh, you see any mountains around? Eh, a little far off there. It's kind of one of those beautiful, picturesque Chinese mountains here. But you know, little... uh, what kind of color are they? How majestic? I mean, it's green, green, uh, little, little brown, purple, green. Huh? Green. Typical. Quite purple. Yeah. Well. Mm-hmm. Uh, huh. Okay. Uh, can we check out the silos? Is is? Uh, we... Yeah. You go. You the farmer's off the property right now. We need to figure out why he's doing this. And so, uh, you go in there. Like, there's antennas. You're you're like seeing GPS jammers. Oh. Uh, there we go, Jack. I mean, Jim, I'm Jack. There we go. Yeah, I think you yeah. solved it. Well, wait, hold on. So he's jamming the GPS. But, uh, Jack, for what purpose? Why is he jamming these? Why is a simple farmer out here yeah. jamming the, the, the communications for military planes? Well, uh, all, uh, aviation, uh, all planes. All, all aviation. You know what? Anything that flies. Anything that flies. I, I bet he's in the pocket. Of big ground, <laughs> cars, yeah. bikes, scooters, skateboards. If it's got wheels, he's in their pocket. Yeah. yeah, you know how many tricycles get get pushed every single year? We're talking a million, million, one million of them, one million dollars worth. That's <laughs> what you know annually. That adds up after a while, Jack. That's right. So. Uh, uh, Oh, no go. So, all right. So yeah, you think that maybe he's it, it's a conspiracy. I think maybe uh, you know he's just a simple man uh, uh, with, with 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 a simple plan, and that's literally stay off my lawn. And my lawn technically extends to the heavens. That's right. So uh, how about you stay out of my airspace as well? He goes down to the local. I don't know how you say Radio Shack in Mandarin, but 
you know, he, he buys a few off the rack uh, 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 pieces, puts it together himself, just so people just uh, stay away from his from his fields. Hey, by the way, what kind of uh, crop is he growing? Well, it's a pig farm, actually. It's got pigs, mm, bunch no of grain. pigs. No amber graves of grain, huh? Mm, yeah, typical. Uh, 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 pig, pig farmers, huh? Mm-hmm. Real hog. Hog in the airwaves. That's what he's doing with these jammers. Now, can I check a newspaper and see if there are any roving gangs of aerial pig bandits? There are no pig bandits. Because okay. that was my second guess, is that pig bandits, obviously. So wait a minute. Hold on. But has he ever had a problem with things from the sky before? Has maybe like somebody tried to come in and fly a plane over and 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 screw with his with 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 his yield? I would say there's more accuracy to that than not. Ooh, wait, uh, wait, uh, Jim, Jim. Yeah, what's up, Jack? Is it UFOs? Is he afraid of UFOs? Does he think UFOs use GPS technology? Nope, nope, not afraid of UFOs. Oh. <laughs> there was uh, a word that came up here that's actually one of the one of the words in like the headline too. By the way, no, I think that somebody used a plane to try and kill or scare his pigs. I okay, a helicopter. Now he now imagine a helicopter with a big claw game claw at the bottom of it, <laughs> swooping up the swine. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, I think we're locking in. Somebody was playing fast and loose with his with his with his crop uh, uh, using an aerial uh, uh, machine. Apparently, I'm gonna go jump to it because this will take us forever to get to it. But apparently, here's a problem in China for pig farmers. Gangs tell you, hey, if you don't pay us money, we're going to infect your entire herd, whatever, with swine flu. Oh now, my- how are we gonna get the swine flu there? Drones. We're gonna spray them with drones. <gasps> Put in GPS blockers to prevent gangs from spraying his pigs with swine flu. Oh my god! Commercial pig farmer in China jams drone signal to combat swine fever crooks. Oh my god! Swine fever, sorry, yes. Oh my god, that is next level scumbagger. <laughs> oh my goodness, China. <laughs> so just. And and there are cases of them having pulled this off, yes, uh, like air weaponizing and I don't know uh, making airborne swine flu. I I I, I swine fever. I want to maybe clarify that. Uh, okay. I don't know if they're how related they are, but I don't want to you know uh, misinformation. So yeah, apparently, I mean, enough that this guy was willing to risk the ire of the, whatever the Chinese FAA was with putting up GPS blockers and stuff, because he's like, Hey, um, I don't want this. And so that's a yeah. gangs will threaten you with that. Like how, uh, <laughs> how messed up buying wow. swine. I mean, like just even the, the, the the biohazard of putting together a, a a drone spraying swine flu is is mind boggling. Yeah, uh, I I can't even wrap my head around this. Um, yeah. is, there, is there? There's got to be. There's some YouTube video on on the the you know Baidu version of uh, of, of YouTube about uh-huh. how to. Rig your swine flu container securely to a drone so it can spray over the oh, herd. Oh, it's even worse. The way it works is what they do is they they infect the herd so the farmer has to sell it off cheap so they can go in and buy it. It's even more. Oh know. gosh, so jeez, uh, and and it seems like uh, the the swine fever is is a pretty serious thing. There's another uh, Reuters article here from August of 2019. Uh, saying that uh, the price of, of 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 pig has gone way up because swine fever continues to kill off um, uh, kill off all pigs. Uh, so Stokes Squirrel asks in the chat, who would buy infected swine? The crooks that infected the swine, so they, who are obviously of low moral character, can immediately sell it off as fast as possible before the, you know, they can butcher them as as soon as possible, as soon as they uh, get infected, and they're going to sell tainted meat. This is why 
this is why we get these these flu things. I mean, I, I think I've told this story in the past, but I'll tell it again. Uh, as I graduated with my uh, uh, sixty thousand dollar degree from the prestigious Newhouse School of Public Communication, the chancellor of that school during my commencement explained to everybody that the story that we would be covering as young journalists into the next century in 2005 was bird flu. Bird flu was going to be the story, bigger than climate change, bigger than anything else that even at that point people were talking about. He was very sure, David Rubin was very, very sure, not David Rubin, anyway, uh, he was very sure that, that uh, swine flu was going to be it. And that was at that time exploding out of China. Uh, uh, if you remember, that was uh, a big thing that was happening, uh, you know, in Canada. And SARS was another uh, a, a Chinese-based disease that was spreading around the world. I, I got a feeling that there are some, there's some, some uh, elements of the Chinese culture uh, uh, that, that are, are, are propagating situations like this. Yeah, I... I... I could I could understand one thing if like hey pay us the protection money or we will kill your cattle right we will wipe them out and then haha uh, but then to go another layer deep of like we're going to make your cattle sick or we're going to make the 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 swine sick so that you have to sell them off at a reduced price and then we'll sweep in and 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 uh, Get get you twice, basically. That yeah, well, it might yeah, it might be that like <clears throat> in that area there might be one buyer or group of buyers because also we hear gangs and we tend to think like you know guys with bandanas and knives and stuff. These are businesses. These are like like you know we've seen outside of China like triad like level stuff. These are companies and businesses that look like legit businesses, but at the top they're owned by people engaged in criminal activity, and that's the sort of thing I think they kind of often gets confusing, you know, and so what'll happen is you might have like, you know, you know, the inner inner kingdom meat trading company, you know, is actually owned by, you know, and I don't know if there's no inner kingdom meat company right now, uh, yeah. maybe owned by, you know, some gang and, you know, certain criminal upper enterprise. And also what happens too is because they buy off the inspectors and stuff. Cause it might be like, oh, your, your, your meat's infected. Like, yeah, you're not gonna be able to sell it. We can buy it. Cause we can, we, we own the inspectors and, you know, they'll sign off on it. So, um, you know, it's a, it's fascinating, you know, and, and, and it's a, it's, it's not obviously a, a uniquely China problem with, you know, these issues or inspections and stuff like this. It is, it is a, a, a big problem. And I would say that there's an argument to be made like bird flu could have been much bigger, you know, swine fever could have been much bigger, but because of efforts to prevent these things from spreading and it, you know, one of the things that is amazing is how well it would appear to be that when stuff like this happens and some scientists there and some scientists here are like, Hey, this is real serious. We need to get together and solve this stuff. You know, they're pretty good at, you know, getting in and, you know, trying to prevent things from spreading. Yeah. We say right now, the zombie flu starts to make its way through the country and, you know, uh, room for improvement, but we do seem to get along pretty well on that level. Yeah. So, uh, you guys want to do picks? Yeah, I will do a pick. Um, I was initially upset to see that the movie that I saw over the weekend was snubbed for uh, the, the Oscars that I thought it deserved, and that was Uncut Gems. Oh, mm. man, Uncut Gems is so good. Uh, until I imagined in my head a scene of Adam Sandler's character, who is a degenerate gambler, uh, with uh, uh, an increasing amount of problems, uh, freaking out because his character was watching the Oscar nomination announcements uh, and uh, uh, had lost a significant amount of money. And then I was made happy because I felt like I got a little short film version of Uncut Gems to play out in my own head. Yeah. Uh, look, it, it, it's there's not a lot of why, there's not a lot of purpose, but... If you like the, I, I can spoil the, the concept of the movie that Adam Sandler's a degenerate gambler who continues to get into increasing creative trouble. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, that's pretty much it. I, I think it does a very, uh, Sandler's great. I think it, it does a great job of building up this very interesting, 
uh, world of uh, circa 2010 Diamond District, uh, New York City. Uh, but beyond that, uh, uh, you know, there, there's not a lot of if you're not charmed by that initial concept. I don't know how much more of the movie there is there for you. Yeah. Uh, there's not a lot of twists and turns beyond what, what you generally know. And if you like that, like I did, boy, you're going to have a good time. If, 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 if you don't, and like my wife, you're going to be like, what a boring movie. I knew really? he was a piece of crap at the beginning, and it turned out he was indeed a piece of crap. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah, I. Uh, it, it is a very kind of Todd Margaret-esque concept of just like a, a – snowballing problems uh but yeah i think it's i think it's so fast and really thrilling the tension uh especially in the like the last sequence of the movie is like really you you really feel it but even from the begin, like that first what like 10 or 15 minutes of the movie where it's just like non-stop and it feels it feels really like unfocused because there's a million yeah. different people talking at once i i thought that was that was really really cool um because it i it got me in i i, I think this movie is really really cool yeah um there are if you're a sports gambler you owe it to yourself to see it there's some although the the, the there are elements toward the end that will stretch credulity in terms of exactly how sports gambling works but uh in general there is a moment there are moments i will i will bring you in to one one moment where uh, Adam Sandler is watching the first quarter of a basketball game and uh, his wife, played by Adina, or, uh, 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 Adina Men uh, Menzel, Denzel, Menzel? Menzel from Frozen, I believe. Yeah. Men um, she uh, comes down to tell him, like, hey, go say goodnight to your child because, you know, he's about to go to sleep and uh he will not leave the television because it's the first it, like in the first quarter of this basketball game because he's got money on it, which is something that just the interplay between those people as somebody who was raised by a gambling addict, there were very hilarious kind of moments, uh, at least to me in terms of how true that was played out. But uh, go see it. Uh, it's it's artfully directed. It's well acted. Uh, it gets great performances out of people that are not actors, uh, I think. Uh, there's a lot of people in the movie that they, this was their first movie uh, up to and including uh, Kevin Garnett, who plays himself, the basketball player. And like has a uh, has a very meaty role and doesn't feel out of place like he really takes to being on the screen really well. No. Yeah. And and I think it, it sticks well within his natural charisma and, and exploits it for all it's worth. Uh, uncut gems. Uh, I think it was it was kind of a. Kind of a, a a sad thing that that a performance like that, which was uh, unique, uh, did not get recognized at the Oscars. But whatever, it's the Oscars. Yeah, I mean, look, if award shows made the right decisions, we'd never talk about them. Well, is it it? You know, he did. You know, Punch Drunk Love, he was great. And then is this? Is it sort of? Is he being punished for everything else? I guess so. I mean, I I, I think that there is an element. I thought for sure he was going to get a nomination just in that uh, if you look at old people who vote for that that are from New York, this is a very New York movie. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and he plays a very only in New York character. Um, it, it's funny to compare it to Punch Drunk. Oh, hold on. So we've got a little, we had a little hookup here. Hey, uh, uh, sorry, can you can you take it back to it's very funny to compare it to Punch, Punch Drug Love? Okay. Thanks. It's funny to compare it to Punch Drunk Love because as a comedic character, Adam Sandler is, and you look at some of his, his roles at the beginning, like Billy Madison or Happy Gilmore, he there's an element of sad sack to him, right? And that is really exploited by Paul Thomas Anderson and Punch Drug Love as he is the sad sack of all sad sacks who just gets bullied by everybody in the world, including his family. Whereas this movie, and you even, you look at like Billy Madison, where he's kind of, kind of a, a, a schemer, right? Kind of somebody that's uh, 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 looking to take the shortcut. Uh, this movie takes that element and just builds this whole world around him where he is this 
absolute uh, 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 cunning sort of uh, uh, you can't believe a word out of his mouth last like the, the the movie begins with him on literally like this is his last chance he has abused every relationship he has ever had he is he is at a point where it's it's uh, the 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 final straw and then the movie goes an hour you know two hours and ten minutes uh it's 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 i don't know i loved it you know that screenwriter william goldman talked a lot or a bit about how uh Actors like leading men won't do certain roles because just sort of ego. They won't, you know, you're never going to see one you know, a guy get, you know, hit his wife or do stuff like this. Anything that they'll do bad things and do this, but there's these lines they won't cross because they're just fearful of the reaction to that. And, you know, there's some actors that are willing to be like, oh, it's a great role, do it, but it's very rare. Very, very rare. So, you know, hats off to him for playing somebody who seems just utterly reprehensible and likable. Yeah, I, I heard an interview with him. He did a a podcast with KG on on the uh, the 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 Bill Simmons podcast. But apparently, one of the fans of the movie was uh, Daniel Day Lewis. Daniel Day Lewis <laughs> called him and was like, "It's like, oh my god, this is great. This is this is amazing." Which Adam Sandler was was blown away by. Uh, who cool. Adam Sandler played the cobbler? Daniel Day Lewis was a cobbler. <laughs> oh, there we go. All there right. Go. <laughs> I got a pick. I, uh, I I recently restarted uh, watching this. I watched it when it came out. When was it? It's been 2016. Wow. It doesn't feel like this was four years ago, but it was. Um, uh, they've got a new follow-up to it uh, coming out. Uh, I restarted watching The Young Pope. Did, it, did any of you guys actually mm. watch The Young Pope? I did not, but I've certainly seen a lot of advertisements for the. I, I the guess the new pope. I that the yeah, I because the new series is called the new pope. Yeah. Uh, I I didn't realize that it was not. I mean, it is the young pope, but now yeah, it's and the, not the two popes, which is totally different. which is a not different Netflix popes. thing, right? There, it's not the slapping pope, uh, uh, who's a real person. <laughs> it's. Uh, <laughs> It's uh, uh, this so many, too many popes, too many popes, too and many popes. I, I wouldn't be surprised if that was like the Netflix play it was be because you can tell when they in the advertisements for the new pope that there are two popes. And that's a big issue. I the young pope is is really weird. So it's it stars Jude Law as like this brash American 40 something year old who becomes the pope. And he has he's very. uh not he's 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 kind of brusque and aggressive um and has a very strong um will for how he should be uh how his how his um how his reign as pope um should be and so he's bumping up against a lot of the politics of the papacy uh the the people who are the, the men behind the pope um and how he sort of butts heads with them and uh kind of fights to get what he wants uh it's 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 very I, weird i i started watching when it first came out and i got like i think justin you think you did too or something i got a couple of episodes into a few episodes into it and and i don't know what this means this is a crit but there is an hbo template for the flawed man storyline and it was the hbo flaw and you saw that with vinyl and you see the stuff that worked really well for like sopranos and then they kind of sort of repeat that and it was very much felt like I was um I knew what the beats were coming, you know, because of that, you know that, and so I sort of lost interest in it because it's like, we're gonna take this and we're gonna apply it to we know the record history. Now we're gonna do it with the Pope, you know, and like I'm like I, you're gonna we're gonna get this guy who's flawed and we're gonna dislike him for some reasons and we're gonna find out he's a little bit more likable because of his backstory. We'll get these flashbacks to this kind of thing, and it, it just, I I I'm sure it's a fantastic show, but it was just it felt very much like, you know that. I mean, Hold up! Is he, is he not just a trash bag the entire time? Because I was under the impression that he was just a trash bag the entire time, and that's uh, I have not seen a, a single frame of any of the popes. Yeah. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, I, I I would assume that that's the point is that it's supposed to be kind of a soapy, trashy, uh, like uh, return to like those old Vatican stories where people are just 
banging and and you know just just reveling in in the excess of so of, it, uh, I, I would say that i i don't know that he has like a redemption arc i mean with the way the 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 young pope as a season ends um they don't really it it seems like they're setting up where the new pope the, the second season could be something but he's in competition with um john malkovich who is brought in at the last second to be the the new pope um i i don't know that redemption is really in the is 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 a part of the story of of this man well i, I didn't think uh, to andrew's point uh it's not like tony soprano was ever redeemed right oh, it's sure. not like all these, these like flawed characters are ever you you see their humanity in flashes but it's it's not like they are yeah, you're rooting for them because you're invested in the story, not necessarily because you think they're great guys. Yeah, this it, this feels uh, uh, the the thing that I like re rewatching the first episode reminded me that I liked it as like a political thriller more than um, a character study. He just seems like a a, a very odd piece that a political thriller is is. Um, uh, yeah, it kind of felt like a I guess House of Cards would be the closest analogy yeah. kind of thing. You yeah. know, um, which is fine. I just, I just was sort of, I don't know. There's sometimes there's like you just sort of you pick up sort of the pacing of a show and and you're like, ah, I'm I'm I, I know it's I, I'm gonna be in these rooms a lot and it's gonna be this reversal in this thing and the thing they're trying to conceal in this sort of and I could be totally misjudge it, but then I just sort of go like, eh, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna go watch Witcher. Uh, <laughs> well, I I dig it. Um, it's yep. I I think there's an oddity to having a pope this young and being very um handsome well a being very incredibly handsome um mm -hmm. and also just like being very disruptive you know he comes in and he yeah. says i don't i you know he's smoking and he says i don't eat breakfast i have a, a what is it a cherry a cherry coke zero for breakfast yeah and they have to rush to find a cherry coke zero for him um, and, and, and some of the interesting decisions that he makes in terms of like, not really wanting to show his face and, um, not trying to, I don't know, break out of the expectations of what you might have for a Pope. Uh, I think it's neat. Uh, you know, um, I, I think our, our Popely friends maybe did not have all the greatest thoughts about it, uh, but I think it's neat and I'm watching it to get ready for the new Pope, which I think comes in, in like a couple weeks on HBO. So. The young Pope. All right. My pick is sort of relevant to today. It's a pick I've made before, but uh, Tesla stock uh, today went past $500 per share. And now if you've been following this sort of the Tesla sort of story, when Tesla had its IPO, it was something like 18 or $20 per share. And it has had this very tumultuous period of, uh, growth and ups and downs and whatnot. Elon Musk is certainly, I guess we could say, a polarizing figure in many respects. Um, and Tesla right now, its valuation is equal to GM and Ford put together. Now, valuation is what the stock price is trading for. It has not been the new of the profitability, anything like this, whatever. But it's a very, very, very interesting story to see what's going on there. Elon Musk famously got in trouble, uh, which was this... This is uh this is my mug from August 2018 when he had the test the tweet you know that he could be he could uh, sell Tesla at, go private at 420 dollars per share which now we know is apparently vastly underselling Tesla by considerable margin um, which got him into trouble and whatnot because he's very frequent on Twitter and lots of money is involved as a, as a point of reference I saw this on Twitter I don't know if this is true but I believe it's probably true. More money has been lost by short sellers. That is people predicting the Tesla stock's going to go down and agreeing to you know, do uh, purchases based on that, what have you. More money has been lost by short sellers on Tesla than Tesla has actually lost in its growth. Huh. Which wow. is, so that, to give you a sense of perspective, like that's how much money is involved on both sides of this whatever. That being said is if you're interested in the topic, the subject, whatever – Ashley Vance's book on Elon Musk, Elon Musk, is one of the best biographies I've ever read. It's I thought it was. You get a lot of insight into Elon Musk. I think you walk away from a, with a much better understanding. And I think that if you're remotely curious or whatever, if you like him or you don't like him, whatever, 
check out the book. It's a very, very good insight, and you get an idea of how he operates, how he functions. And having read that book and followed his story for years, it's like nothing sort of surprises me. You know, nothing surprises me. You know, and, uh, you know, disclosure, I have owned t stock in Tesla and had t t stock in Tesla since, you know, the IPO days. So I'm obviously a bit pro Tesla as far as growth, but I'm not pushing on anybody because it is a very stressful stock to own when, you know, at any moment, Elon could come home, get into an argument or whatever, put out a tweet and go on Joe Rogan. And you could watch a good portion of your portfolio evaporate with one puff of smoke. So, yeah. Uh, but that book I loved. Loved the book. Uh, oh. And and to me, beyond obviously Elon Musk, like you said, a polarizing figure. I've always rooted for Tesla in that, you know, for the majority of my adult life, it was thought to be impossible that, or thought mm -hmm. to be a, a foregone conclusion that we would never have an American car company again. That we would yeah. never have a profitable American car company. And uh, uh, that to me is something that is worth rooting for. Uh, uh, that, you know, we are the country that fundamentally invented and popularized the automobile and made it a global phenomenon and had, you know, our, our auto companies are obviously tied up in a lot of things that make them kind of very hard to kill, but also uh, uh, maybe not as efficient as they could be. And uh, I, I think that the, just the proof of concept that we can do an American car company again is, is good. It's good for the economy. It's good for, American psyche. It's it's good for people who like cars, and it's you stirred, know the uh, it stirred electric electric car development. I mean, there are more electric cars being announced every you know every couple of weeks. It seems from, from yeah, I remember, other manufacturers. Yeah, it's a big part of the future. I remember watching Tucker, the Francis Ford Coppola movie, uh, with uh, Jeff Bridges, which was the story, a very fictionalized account of Tucker, who was the guy who tried to create another car company and failed. And the walk away from that was the car companies won't let you do the conspiracy. It's not going to happen. You, yeah. You'll never be able to do it. And you, you know, and that's, you know, and it made a persuasive sort of like, oh, geez. And, and, and that was very much a personal story to Coppola who had to battle studios, et cetera, what have you. And the fact that it's Justin pointed out that here we have a company that is now worth more than Ford and GM says something and uh, you know i mean there and you'll hear like oh well, i've heard about this allegation here whatever every nobody should be on be beyond investigation or approach whatever but understand that when the point i mentioned before more money has been lost on people betting against this company than that company lost it tells you there are a lot of people that hate 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 and some of the stuff you see make it into the news whatnot like i see stuff on twitter all the time where some people try to create this like ah this, this export restriction is going to prevent self-driving from going overseas, and they will cherry-pick things from some government reg and cut out the part that says it has to do with, let's say, satellite imagery or stuff like this. And you see people actively trying to influence the market against them, and, and then happens the other side, too, people who try to pump it. But there is a real, real effort to try to push the stock down because billions of dollars have been lost. And it's not unique to Tesla, but it's a, one of the standout ones. And so... You have to sort of step back from all that and go like, there's a lot of money involved. I don't know if I should believe anybody and just watch instead. Well, I mean, yeah, uh, look, and and I think this has become a story largely because uh, Elon has uh, talked about it, you know, um, and and made it a a a big thing. He has pointed out that like this is a a that there is a a large amount of short sellers and and there is. No denying that I think uh, was Tesla was like the most it still might be the the most shorted stock uh, uh, in in the market that there was so much money uh, betting against it and to be fair again it, there's good reason why you would no. bet against it theoretically right because it's never yeah, it, it, it was thought to be impossible yeah I I'm you know, I'm a believer in the value of short selling. Like I've had friends who are like, ah, they should. I'm like, no, it serves a real value. If you think a company is grossly overvalued and you think that they're going to underperform, whatever, it's part of market corrections and stuff. So I, I have no problem with that. Um, but it's funny if you go, if you want ever to take a deep dive, you go into Tesla on Twitter and you look at the different hashtags, like there's 
dollar sign tsla dot q and you get like those are sort of all the tesla the tesla bears and stuff and, and you can just read this you know you know every every kind of allegation load you can imagine you know how you know elon musk is you know you know probably going to be you know supplying missiles to iran or something like that according to this i mean just crazy sort of stuff but you know there might be you know real issues there that need to be addressed too so i'm here to say neither pro nor con just saying it's a very interesting story and check out the Ashley Vance book. There you go. So gentlemen, it's been weird. Hey, look at that. Look at that, look at that, look at that. Good job. I got that. Alrighty. Uh after things. We'll do after things here in just a moment. If anybody needs to take a break, now would be an okay time to do that. All right, we're back. Yeah. Uh, uh, uh. Well, uh, so Night Attack Wednesday, right? Right, Night Attack is going to be on Wednesday this week. Um, uh, which means I will be streaming the full presidential debate tomorrow. Oh, fun. That's um. Uh, and yeah, and what Brian's back Thursday, and then you guys are here next week. Uh, is that right? Yeah. We should have plane tickets. He was texting me about plane tickets over the weekend. Okay. Oh uh, yeah, so he get he'll be back on Thursday. Right. Yeah, I guess we need to figure out Sketchfest. Oh. Uh, yeah, so we'll be live in, in uh, San Fran for Sketchfest. That'll be fun. Uh, we'll record it as we always do and try to get it out. I guess that's because that's that shows on Wednesday. It is. I guess we'll have to figure out whether we want, <laughs> whether we want to do a Tuesday show or do another late week. In in talking with Brian, it seemed like he was into doing the Tuesday show and then coming out Wednesday and doing the Wednesday show, and so we would have a week off the next week. Yeah. Um, but up to you guys. That seems fine. Uh. That, that seems fine by me. I'll have to move some stuff around. I also don't know whether or not he uh, actually booked the tickets that we were talking about. So maybe. <laughs> yeah, like, usually like, he's usually he's pretty good about sending me an itinerary when he buys tickets, and I have not received them. So I guess we'll this was Sunday. He was asking about things around Sketchfest and whether or not when if it would make sense to come in early or later. Um. He then said Tuesday was expensive, but Wednesday would make more sense and then asked and then said the last thing that i heard from brian was i'll peek and see if some weird las vegas half step makes more sense how would it i you know you know the mind we're talking about you know you know you know he knows i have stuff i have to do during the week right oh my goodness okay well all right i'll be right yeah good That's next week. That's the craziest thing. Oh wait, shit! We can't be off the week after that. I mean, S word. I need to send many emails now. How are you doing, Andrew? I'm doing good. Uh, editing the book for I have a book coming out in. April, uh, April, May, then I have another book coming out in November, so I'm editing the book for November, and then I got to next month sit down, write another novel, get that done, and then just helping my girlfriend with her, she's making, you know, her short films and stuff, and her horror stuff, so. Yeah, that's cool. Doing I mean, that. That must be good to, um, you know, to, to be to, to be deep in it, to be deep in the stuff that you love, right? You love writing. I am. I am 
so effing lucky, and lucky is the right word because um, uh, there are the world is filled with creative people, and you know, I, I had opportunities that sort of you know fell into my lap and stuff, and I'm very, very, very grateful for that. And uh, work with a great, great agent, great publishing team, etc., and that, and to be able to have the ability to kind of live my uh it's funny because like i have a lot of free time but i don't feel like i have free time because i feel like i'm always trying to get so much stuff done but i feel very very lucky though um i mean i've always been i've always sort of fallen into sort of stuff you know i've always been kind of like that but yeah but yeah i consider my, I, I i try to appreciate how grateful i am that you know i get a it's working it's working yeah. We're yeah. again, but then it's but it's that the whole thing we talked about before. Then it's time to level up. It's like you know, I did, I did the whole Shark Week thing because I said, man, I'm becoming complacent and you know, uh, doing you know one or two books a year is great, but it's not. I need to be. I shouldn't just sit back and go, yeah, figured out life because everything comes to an end, you know. And that's the the thing that I'm trying to, you know, I drill into my own head is the idea that like you can you. As an artist, the problem. Oh, we could save it for after things. Okay, yeah, we'll talk. Yeah, we can talk about that for after things. Yeah, uh, that's a good topic. Yeah. Uh, all right. Also, uh, so it is two forty-eight central now. Um, we also don't have Brian for Cord Killer, so I have to do a bunch of extra prep today. So if we could be wrapped, if we could have a soft out at like three thirty for yeah, after sure. things. No problem. Uh, yeah. I have to do. I have to do all the stuff that I normally do, and then I have to do all the stuff that Brian normally does. Uh, just yelling at you. Yeah, that's right. I have to. <laughs> I have to rig up an entire system to yell at myself. Uh, cool. Well, uh, I think I'm good to go. If Let's go. All right, then, Andrew. I'm going to count you in. In three, two. Hello, and welcome to After Things. I'm Andrew Main, joined by Justin Robert Young. Hey, what's going on? Mr. Bryce Castillo. Hello. How's it going? <laughs> so mysterious. So right before uh, we started recording, I started going off on a tangent about like, uh, kind of like my life is a writer and creative. And one of the things that I keep having to drill into my own head because I've watched other creatives make this mistake. And that is, uh, you know, <laughs> what's the... <laughs> I forget who was listening to somebody like, you know, you know, why are creatives so upset? It's because we're all poor, you know, and, and that's often the case is if you're a creative, you spend a lot of time working towards something and you spend a tremendous amount of energy on a thing that has no immediate reward. You know, maybe you have a job or maybe you spend part of your time in your job and part of your time, your creative energy working on something that will maybe pay off someday. Right. And you know, if you are a, a writer, that can be the case. You could spend several years working on a book. Most cases, that thing never happens, but sometimes it does. And even rare cases, it becomes a hit and the book sells a lot of money. It sells a lot. That's great. But the mistake that can be made for writers, I see this with actors. Actors struggle for a few years, then they get some big commercial gig and they, they get a, a, a chunk of change. Not millions, but still more money than they've had at one given time, like two years worth of a salary all at once or something. The creative brains, the creatives, often what happens is we think this is the new normal. You know, you get this windfall. You know, all of a sudden you get this book contract. Somebody's paid you $50,000 for a book. Like, oh, wow, I just got $50,000 for this thing. And, you know, uh, you know, would have been, you know, when I was younger, a year's worth of work, whatever, all at once. And if I had this every year or whatever, you start to think like that. And because you feel that it's due and that it should be coming to you, and then maybe you spend some of it or spend more of it than, you know, you really want to, but you sort of think that more will come and maybe more will come. But eventually, even if you're even if you're the top actor in the world, you're going to have good years and you're going to have bad years. And we often get confused because you'll hear about some successful actors having financial problems or something or is fighting with their, you know, their lawyers or their agents. I mean, you're like, how is this? Because I just saw them in this movie and they must have made millions for it. Well, you might have an actor that might make 20 million a year. Well, it's rarer now, but you might have make 20 million a year. And then they have a couple off hits or whatever things don't get made put into development and then they make five million which you're like well that's still a lot of money but if you're like that up actor 
bought one of the islands we talked about in Weird Things, and that actor has a staff of 20 people or so. You know, right now, I've only seen little glimpses of it, but you watch this, the Kevin Hart series on Netflix, and you realize you're just Kevin Hart, and there's like 20 30, 20, 30 people that work for him. You know, there's an entire team of people that he has to pay, you know, and keep them going. And so my point is it's going to happen to anybody. And that's the thing that I always, I always try to be mindful of is when things are really good is assume this is not the norm. Plan for when it's not. And that's my biggest piece of advice is just like, you know, when you hit, when you hit your high level of success, assume that might be the peak and assume that everything else from there on out is going to be down and just try to make the best of that. You know, uh, the biggest lesson that I learned in my 20s and brought into my 30s was to always have a next. Yep. Always have a thing. Always have, like, the next thing you want to do. Because the biggest heartbreak I ever saw in myself or my friends was always when all the eggs were in one basket, yep. you know? And, and I think that that's, it's such a danger and it really is something that is wholly avoidable. It's it, because I don't think that, you know, th there's, there's a conflation between, you know, I think, God, I, I can't remember who it was, but I think it was a magic interview that I did where I was asking, you know, what, what's the, the biggest piece of advice that you would give to somebody that's starting. And that was like, don't have a plan B like have, have this be your, 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 your one thing. Because if you are a magician, but you're also a travel agent at some point, there's going to in any entertainment lifestyle and entertainment journey, there's going to be a rough patch where you're going to be like, God, this sucks. Like, why don't I just spend more time being a travel agent and, and doing that? And that you'll, that, that, that desire will be uh, so great. And, Certainly, there is a value to m knowing what you want and going out and getting it. But at the same time, man, just having that little other that little other thing that you could have and 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 it doesn't have to be the nine to five job if you're like, all right, no, I want to be a gig entertainment worker. like you can have another gig entertainment thing that benefits your your main pursuit, but also is, on some way divergent, right? Like on some way, uh, uh, you know, puts your skills that you are honing in another basket or, or you keep trying different projects. Like th there is a way that I think just mentally you can uh, sharpen yourself and always have another thing that you want to do, another uh, wing to this house that you're building. I I, I'm all for building up skills and stuff, but I'll, I'll tell you who was that don't have a plan B. Do you remember who said that? Uh, no, I don't. Penn and Teller. What was What's Penn? Yeah. Because yeah. Penn's attitude was, because he convinced Teller to quit teaching because he said, hey, if we're going to go do this, we got to do it 100%. We can't do it half-assed. It can't be, you know, oh, we'll go do this on the weekends. We'll do rent fairs on the weekends. During the rest of the week, we're going to have jobs. If we want to do this, we got to go all out into it like that. Now, Teller had, Penn had his juggling, and Teller had his teaching. But the idea there, though, is in, which I, I, I believe in, and I think that some of my failure in life has been for me being not all in on something. Because once you're all in, you think differently. I should have, I probably should have moved to LA five years earlier than I did. You know, I had real credible reasons for not doing it, but I can think of a lot of times where I tried to half ass it because I said, well, I'm going to do this thing too, and this will be my safety net, this, whatever. And I spent just as much time developing that. And I'm not in the point of fear and the point of cunning. You know, there's a point where you commit yourself to it and you say, I've got to make this thing work. And I can't go home tonight. I can't do this. So yeah. I think it comes down to the kind of person you are too. And, and, you know, if you're the kind of person who, you know, you are doing a nine to five and maybe you're doing something, you're doing your passion on the side and you are trying to, um, you know, you are about to make that leap. Or if you are starting to wonder, like, Sh is this the right time um, or when when is the right time? Um, mm -hmm. The other big thing, which which I, I don't know that we talk too much about on this show is like networking and like making sure you like know people know your contemporaries um sure as Look, as much as you're able to expand your network in 
you know, like I, I, I know on, on Twitter, I follow a lot of comedian people and, uh, just this past week, uh, college humor changed ownership and almost everybody got fired. Video staff, writing staff, illustration stra staff, and, and, you know, hope, you know, you hope that all those people can find, find work again. And when you're thrown into that unexpected situation, networking is, is a big thing. No, who you know helps out a lot. I think it's critical. Let me, let's talk about that in a second. I, I want just one more thought. If you guys want to respond to it too. I, when I'm talking about the all in, I mean, if you say that, like you want to be pin, if you're a magician, say, no, I want to be pin and teller. I want to be in Vegas. I want to be headlining there. That's what I mean. If you're just like, no, I want to build a side business where I do shows on the weekend and whatever. Yeah, that's different. That's fine. But to be all in to say, I knew when I wanted to become a writer, when I wanted to do that, I knew I had to spend a good year of doing nothing but writing. And I stopped, I'd even actually stop pitching TV shows and everything else like that, which as fate always works, that's when I started getting the calls to do TV was once you stopped doing it. But I, I, it's, it's a risky situation because most times it will fail. So the smart advice is, yeah, is to do something else. In the cases of the people that have succeeded incredibly well, it's all in, you know, it's just that, that all in kind of thing. But, but Justin's right. Like that's not the formula for success because the formula says that most people won't. Well, but, but let me, let me parse that just a little bit more because one of the greatest things about the career of Penn and Teller is, you know, they have always hustled beyond the act, right? The act mm -hmm. is the act. They care about the act. They love the act. It's the reason why they, uh, the, they are the longest running headliners in Vegas, I believe. And, uh, uh, they are, th their act is still fresh. It still wins awards because they care about it. They also have done video games and, and done reality television competitions. And they've done a, a bunch of different things because they know that that adds on to their success. That that is, that is a huge part of it. And I, 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 I think that, there is a massive benefit to always thinking uh, uh, kind of globally on, on that, on, well, on but I, career. Yeah, but those were things about the Penn and Teller brand. And I'm trying to think the early, the early days before we knew who Penn and Teller were, you know, it was a focus. It wasn't like Teller I, didn't go I, and I'm direct. Not, yeah, I'm yeah. not, I'm not, I'm not disputing that. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, then you grow. Yeah, you grow because you have, it evolves over time. What are you? What do you do? And I think they've done, you know, a wonderful job of, they're still so relevant. They're still so relevant, you know? You know. Uh, Bryce, your point on networking, uh, you know, if I were to go through my many, many flaws, like I am I am horrible, horrible, horrible. And I don't mean networking. And it, networking kind of gets its bad sort of name because it's like you go to a network meetup and it's just a bunch of opportunists trying to meet other opportunists and nobody has opportunity. Yeah. But just genuine keeping in touch with people and doing this stuff, I'm the worst at that. You know, I'm the kind of thing, like, if everything fell out from underneath me, like, tomorrow, like, I would be in my car. I'd live in my car because I don't, I, I don't, I don't have enough of a network to be able to talk to people like, hey, you know, who do you know here who's... <laughs> Who's looking for a guy to sit around all day and think about book? I don't know. I just I'm very bad. Even though I live in L.A., I'm horrible at that. Yeah, I I, I know I'm not great at it. Um, I I I I have a tough time meeting new people and talking to new people. Um, I found that the times when it has been easiest for me, or I have made lasting um, sort of connections, is doing is working with people. Uh, mm -hmm. Whether it's collaborating or whether, you know, asking advice, giving advice, um, asking questions like um, because you're right. Like go, you go to you go to a meetup and you kind of don't know who's going to be there. You don't kind of know the level of experience or kind of where you are in life. You know, I mean, it's it's a wide open pool and, and um, it, it, there's a there's a little there's there's a good amount of chance uh, in in that but when you work together with somebody then you get a really innate sense of how you feel about that person oh mm -hmm. like not just oh they do good work and i i i admire that but here was like here was how i responded as we worked together here was like how you know we got and 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 that makes like a much more lasting impression than we traded business cards and we talked on the phone every well, so often. So I, I want to throw this out there. Like, uh, 
I want I want to I want to quiz each one of us here. Okay. All right. Uh, yesterday was Sunday, which maybe be maybe atypical, but how many people did you either talk to on the phone or text with yesterday? Let me pull up mine. I think the answer would be just in time. Maybe like four. I think it would be four, and one of those was a group chat. Um, and assuming we're not talking about like Discord or something, which is already like a big group communications device, I think it would be three or four for me. I I texted with four people yesterday. Um, I texted with four people yesterday, and it's the same people I spoke to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I uh, spoke to Andrew. Texted with Brian. Obviously, talked to my wife. Uh, and then I think I texted two other people. Yeah, Scott about his YouTube channel, and then Heaton about an email that I got sent to both of us. But uh, I would, yeah. So those those were the people. I would have thought you would be more. I always because I know your your network is just way bigger. It was just because it was I, Sunday. Yeah, that's that's so funny because I think I'm, I'm a terrible network. I don't like. I mean, like I I. I think I, I I I find myself receding as I get older. I yeah. find myself kind of like, especially well, now that I don't work in a, a office or anything like that. I find myself just kind of like inventing more and more reasons why I should talk to less and less people. <laughs> and it's not. Um, it, it's 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 slightly removed from just charisma, right? Like. It's one thing to be like on the podcasts and we, we you know, we talk, we, we do our thing for a couple hours, um, but like opening up and like talking to new people or even just like keeping up the relationships that you have in your personal life. Um, and feels also like such a different it's like thing. So I, I, cause I know like, I think people might see you Justin as like a very bombastic, you know, big personality, but I know that, you know, you're still pretty even keeled. Oh yeah. I mean in my in my you know, my when I'm not around. I mean I'm still a an animated, you know, uh kind of guy just screwing around. I don't think there's like you know, my my especially a night attack, you know, my 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 persona there is is certainly a part of me. Uh uh but it is it is an exaggerated part of me. Uh otherwise, like I don't know. I really do like talking to people, which I think does lend me to be a good networker if I'm out and around, right? Like, I think there was a reason why with, with iTrix, I was able to meet and become friends with a bunch of people fairly quickly within a few years because I was, uh, you know, I do just like asking questions and I like, uh, and, and specifically in magic, I liked asking questions that were beyond the questions that magicians ask each other constantly so it and was, that's a it was format out. you know that's that's kind of like a mixed use right you get to do both um you have like the the ease of like hey we're doing this thing and here is kind of what that looks like normally yeah. i mean like i most of my really good friends now came from that period of my life you you're know? welcome came from magic really and yeah. that's like you know brian and andrew and i mean andrew obviously was was the the, the progenitor of it but it's like even now, I, I I look at my Facebook and it's like eighty percent people talking about magic stuff that I has not been a daily part of my life in in a long time. Uh, Sorry about that one. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's, it's mostly fun until the bitching starts. But uh, uh, you know, in in general, I do like talking. But although I'm about to get back into that because now I'm gonna I'm going out on the road to cover the politics stuff, and I realize that like. Wow, the most pivotal part of this is going to be meeting up with people at you know at the bars afterward and and leveraging some of the connections that I've made through the last few years to be like to to be more of a part of that. And uh, I I'm kind of scared of it because you know there have been some times where I've met people and I think they're dicks. And I don't know if I have 
that like laugh it up. Part of the reason why I was a good networker in my twenties was because I really in I sometimes like enjoyed assholes. I enjoyed hanging out and <laughs> and being around assholes because like uh wait the, a second here. <laughs> now what company is he continuing to keep? I'm just like, well and and uh 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 Andrew was never an asshole. I mean mostly. Uh uh <laughs> 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 um, um, you know, but you know, but, but even through like my college times in New York and comedy and stuff like that, you have to have a fairly high threshold for like, oh, that's just them. That's just that person being that person. And I was at Politicon and I met people that will remain unnamed that, you know, had a little status and they were total dickheads. And I was just like, wow, do I just not want to be around you at all? There was no charming element to that in a way that I feel like a 25-year-old me would be like, ah, ha, ha, classic, this person being this person. Uh, and and I, don't, I don't know. I don't know if that makes me. But then again, I also don't know if that's just me in my head inventing more and more reasons to be around less and less people. You know, there is that thing as you get older and, you know, part of it is like, I know for me it was like realizing how much of me not being cool to other people was because of my, and not intentionally, but just my own insecurity. Like how much my own insecurities rob people like, oh, he's kind of aloof or this, whatever. I'm like, oh no, when we met at a party, I was scared. I didn't know anybody. I didn't talk because I was afraid to say something stupid. Be like, oh no, I just thought, you know, you, people you realize like this, but you kind of reach a point too, where you, when you do meet people who kind of get away with being a, a, like, I, I'm a couple occasionally, I've been at parties where people have been kind of like, try to be kind of like, I don't know, uh, big shot stuff, and I just kind of call it out right there, because like I just, you, there's no need, you know, like, like, you know, uh, uh, you know, I, I go into examples of this, but sometimes you just sort of like, I kind of now I kind of like, well, I'm gonna go shut this person down because I just saw them be rude to this other person, which just was not acceptable, and if I'm ever like that, I would love for not love in the moment, but I would appreciate if somebody to remind me like, Hey, you know, you don't look like a good guy right now when you treat people like that, you know? Yeah. But you know, I just get older. I just have less patience for that because, you know, I, I, you can't give time to everybody, but it's not an excuse to be mean. And, in in you know, it just sort of shows insecurities. Yeah. And I mean, you know, if, if we're just talking about people being, you know, a holes, like don't forget, like, Fine, Bryce. Just let it loose. <laughs> let me hear it. Fine. Like, uh, you know, it's interesting hearing you say that, Andrew, that you are the kind of person who would be like, hey, I'm like, you need to, I'm giving you the red light. Like, you should, like, re examine yourself. Because I, I am not that type of person. I am, I am like a grin and bear it type of person who, and I just, I just remember, people remember, you are not invisible. Um, mm -hmm. And, and, more likely than not, I think people will just simply remember the way that you act, um, and yeah. go that, and go from there. Yeah, that somebody, somebody, nobody ever said that. <laughs> the comment was, "Man, Bryce is the biggest jerk in her tank." <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, as a practice, like what I do on Twitter, like, um, I um, never, to my knowledge, five, six, I, I don't think I've ever gone negative. And even even I avoid trying to be snarky with people because I might I sometimes I'll, I'll put a thing up there like uh, I had uh, somebody threw up some sort of I said something and somebody put up some sort of analogy and I responded like with another like this, whatever. And they went ballistic like, no, you're simplifying things, blah, 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 blah. And you're smug, da, 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 da. And I'm like. And it's one of these things like, man, like you should really read this tweet thread and see who's got the smugness. But I don't want to get into, I don't want to have that discussion. Yeah. I don't want to have that because I said, I want to be a nice guy. Yeah. And I'm, and the nice guy responds is I wrote back like, oh man, I didn't mean to offend you. I thought we we're having a friendly conversation. And that, and not a passive aggressive way, whatever, not a, hey, but you said this. No, let me point out this thing that you did that was wrong. I'm just like, like legit, like I didn't want to offend that person. You know, uh -huh. I, and I didn't mean, so, and, and, and that's been my approach. And again, not like I'm going to win them over, but I'm just like, I'll put down the rope right now because I'm here to be friendly. And if I say something that doesn't come across friendly, no, but it's so apologies. interesting because again, I'm like the opposite on that on Twitter. That's where I will like, be like, Hey, like you don't need to be doing this or telling me this, you know, because in that, yeah. in that instance, it's like, um, 
a, a lot of times, you know, if someone retweets something and then someone else sees it and then it's it's people you don't it's people removed from people you would know, mm -hmm. um, then it's just like you don't I am a stranger to you. You don't need to talk to me that way. Um, yeah, I, but that's I, me being stubborn. That's a place where well, I feel like I can be aggressive and then I just get stubborn about protecting myself. I remember what it was is I retweeted the, the Matt Ridley article about how the last 10 years has been the best years for human human history. And, and the, you get in the article it talks about how for the poorest people on the planet, that's the point of it is for the, the poorest percentage of the planet, the quality of life has improved dramatically. Huh. The problem is it's an article where if you see the headline, many people think they know what the, they think that it's they they don't they many people will assume like oh yeah if you're rich it's been great and it's like no the point of this is if you're poor it's been great because of eradication of disease all these other things in there so i retweeted this because it's like let's pay attention to what works if we want to solve the problems well let's look at what worked and growing economies things like that work and i had two people who are like the same thing like oh a lot of rich people are feeling that like ah oh, you probably feel that in your smug fancy restaurant whatever and it's like i know they didn't read the article I know they didn't read the article, you know, and, and it's like, I also know that they don't see where you eat. True that. <laughs> that is very true. And so, uh, and I'm like, okay, I can ignore. And usually I just ignore some, I'm like, I'm going to engage, but I want to do this in a way where I be, I'm sincere. I'm, I'm not passive aggressive and trying to present myself as this assertive person, but really being passive aggressive and angry. Cause it's like, I, I want this person to read the article. I want them to, to, to do this. And so, you know, my response is like, well, I, I think the data is I write the day I think the data is pretty sound, but if there's some fact or something to take exception to, you know, I'd love to know what it was. Yeah. Which is my way of saying, did read you read it? And, and, the, and the answer wasn't both times was basically an F you, whatever. I don't need to read this to know. And it's like, all right, <laughs> there's no conversation to have here. You know, yeah. one guy said, Now I'm blocking you. I'm like, and there's no reasoning with that. But yeah. anyhow, I guess my point is like I've made a big effort like on Twitter to engage with people, but just not to use mental judo, not to point out where they're dumb or where the mistakes they made. Just try to be sincere as possible. That's a good, yeah. That's a good plan. Uh, uh, I mean, also, man, uh, uh, evergreen lesson. Uh, uh, the internet is where tone goes to die. Like anything that you write, email, Twitter is, is the, the most – a ridiculous form of it, but like yeah. anything you write, especially if you think it might be controversial, do yourself a favor and read it in the angriest, most unfair tone that you possibly can read it back in, in your head. And even if you're like, nobody would, yes, you don't control that. Like at the yeah. very least, you don't know how people are reading it. You don't know what's above and below it. You don't know what mood people are in. Like, that is that is always something where uh, you 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 have to you have to figure it out. You know, I uh, yeah. I I the the past like week or so, I have felt I've I've just been like being I've been more aware of. So on my phone, I have this you, the they had the Apple um, Screen Time report, so you can yeah. have it tell you every month or every week. Here are the apps that you use the most. Here are what you had on screen the longest. And Twitter was usually like the highest one for me. And I fell, found between either the times that I waste just like grazing on Twitter, you know, just like looking for anything new to look at um, and having um, a wide spectrum, let's say, of, of interactions on Twitter Um I I started doing the uh, uh, there's a what is I don't know it's like a time limit you can say on your phone like hey oh, yeah. only let me spend about 15 minutes a day on Twitter and it, it'll give me a little five minute warnings like hey you have five minutes left on Twitter and when it goes out a little uh, hourglass comes up and you know you can say like hey give me another minute or give me another fifth remind me again in 15 minutes or something or you can just turn it off for that like it like it's a very soft limit but it's enough where i see the icon get grayed out and i go yeah i probably don't need to find it. i actually don't need to know what's happening right now i actually don't need to be up on current events um i uh, that and that, that, that makes sense like i was using it a lot like i use it now when something's going on like the whole iran stuff whatever i'll go there because 
there's probably a half dozen or so people who all go see what they're saying because I know they're very good at covering a wide, wide range of opinions. Number one, which I like because I'm like, well, this is what this group is saying here. This is what this person's saying here. And sometimes some of these are people who are often, sometimes I'll see stuff there before it makes it into the rest of the news. Sure. So I use it a lot more now for news um, yeah, because I, I found I, it actually uh, I'm less siloed, mm. you know, by doing that and, and more doing a search function and not just follow up five people who say this, I'll do search functions to see, who's talking on topics. Yeah. But, but I think it stuff be like, to, you know, today we're recording this on the 13th, all the Oscar nominations came out and mm -hmm. just seeing everyone, you know, be like, Oh, this, this didn't happen. This happened. Like all, I am like not into major award shows at all in any case. So, um, well, for, there's for no me to be like there. on that... it and wasting time of like, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah okay. And, then I, because also at that point you read it, and you read people that you appreciate and you like and you like their opinions and they're passionate about it. And then you're like, wait, do I really have an Aquafina take? Right. Like, yeah. I write something about how I really feel like I don't even see that movie. Like, like, should I really like get furious about it? Like, do I even like Aquafina? Like, like, why is, is this like, I think, should I just retweet somebody who made a funny comment about Aquafina? And then you realize like, I, I'm with you, Brez. Like, I, you, you scroll and you're like, God damn it. It was the top of the hour when I started thinking about Aquafina, and now it's the end of the hour. Like, I've been on this stupid app, like, just looking at, like, I, I've just been sucked into this vortex of, like, like every pull of the of, of, of the refresh might have the answer for me. Right. And but it, it never it, does. Yeah. It never it, does. The experience, well, that's, yeah, that's some, part of it is just like, my, I don't, I'm, I'm not finding I, – I have good heartwarming moments sometimes on Twitter, but a lot of times it's just wasted time. And I yeah. feel like hours, there are just days where I'm just like, somebody say something so I can look at something, um, when in reality it would just be better if I watched a TV show or something instead. Yeah, yeah I – I, I find that too. Like I love like my RSS feeds and stuff there. Cause I reached the end of it, you know, and I'm like, ah, I've got all the news I need, but I do find that like when big events happen, I like going there and looking at different sort of, cause like you find out stuff before or you, you sort of realize we don't know anything, go back to work, you yeah. know? Um, so, but, yeah. and again, it's, it's, you know, the, the, the ever, the ever complex unfolding of, twitter.com hell of but a I, I, but i like it if you're intellectually honest to meaning you're looking to get multiple oh. look at different perspectives it's an uh, amazing tool let me put it this way twitter rules like and i don't know whether or not i am here to say that that when it comes to twitter i don't know if i'm defending democracy or heroin like I right. really don't know whether or not I feel like it is entirely plausible that that in in ten years I'll be like, oh yeah, that was that time that I was running up and down yelling everybody the health benefits of shooting up, or uh, I am indeed Cicero writing about the benefits of democracy. Like I, I I really I am I am unsure, but I know that they both have double edged swords. That uh, 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 right now I just look there. Sporting events, these kinds of discussion, you dip in, you can get these great things. I wouldn't have even realized that there were a lot of people pissed off about the fact that like Uncut Gems and, and Aquafina and J-Lo didn't get nominations. But I look back and I saw Hustlers and I'm like, yeah, I don't know what I thought when, when I walked out of Hustlers, I thought that J-Lo could get, a, could get a nomination because that was a really good performance. I don't know. Beyond that, I don't know if I need to go into the history of, of, of Latina representation and awards uh, uh, shows or whether or not Hustlers was indeed a solid enough movie to, to merit consideration. But I'm glad that I had that thought. I'm glad that I looked at it and I'm like, oh, cool. Look, look at that. I enjoy movie conversation. Some of my favorite conversations in life have been getting into uh, the, the, the relative merits of movies. I'm glad I got to into that and then go away. But at the same time, I can see where, boy, howdy, if you don't, if you don't, if you don't always keep a sight of the coastline, you can find yourself out to sea real quick. That riptide is quick. My, my girlfriend had asked me, like, 
uh, she's asked like, what do I think of like the the whole uh, uh, Harry and Meghan Markle thing, you know? And I'm like, I I don't need to have an opinion on that at all. <laughs> like, I don't need to have an opinion at all. And not to say that it's not relevant to something or whatever, but I'm like the, the amount of hard drive space that I should be apportioning to that zero. Zero. Yeah. It is amazing. That's one of those things where the story I want to talk about with the, with that whole thing is how many different ways this has been sliced to make it a part of another story, yeah. right? That it's like, oh, it's about Diana dying. It's about conspiracies. It's about the royal family being this bloodthirsty uh, a, a relic that this person is escaping. No, 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 no. It's about Meghan Markle being this American social justice warrior and her uh, uh, destroying a, a yet another uh, uh, institution that these SJWs are, are doing. And it's like, I'm like, I don't give a rat's ass, whatever. Let them live their lives. If they want to leave and not do photo ops, let them leave and not do photo ops. Let them make a, give them a Queeby series. <laughs> Everybody it's a Queeby series. Yeah. Give the kids a Queeby series. <laughs> if that's what they want so bad, give them a Queeby. Suits, too. <laughs> Whatever. Well, let's I, I would, fine. I would, give it to them. What was interesting was the video of Harry talking to Bob Iger and how that just sort of disappeared from everywhere. And <laughs> then that becomes its own thing, right? <laughs> like that, that yeah, that, that's a, it's an Iger thing. And they're going to go to Hollywood. They're going to go to Canada. They're going to go to whatever. And it's like, uh, uh, what's what's fascinating to me is that it is this very bizarre Rorschach of like the the there were the, the 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 final relics of the monoculture. Like now there is no way to just talk about like are they unhappy? Is <laughs> what what is the role of the royal family in the modern world? Right, because those would be the monoculture kind of ideas of it. No everything gets sucked into their own subcultures. And then those, those stories become their own things and everybody has their own evidence to make it. And to be fair, I'm not here to pass judgment on it. No. Yeah, that all can be true, right? Like, I just have no interest in those subcultures and therefore I don't really have much of an interest on the royal family and so fine, cool. They're going, they're coming, they're staying. Somebody knew, somebody didn't knew. They don't like each other. Uh, 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 fine. I'm sure that there's a lot of British people for whom the the you know that want to criticize us. This for the sounds Kardashian. a lot like you having an opinion on the royal family. There's a lot of royal family talk going on for the man who has no opinion on the royal family. A lot. I mean, I pay attention to news, so you can't help but know at least a, a, a passing uh, amount about it. Yeah. But. Uh, 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 I, I I find it fascinating that it is it is subsumed into so sub many other subcultures. And the reason why I do know so much about it is because it's subcultures that I care about, that I read about. And so it's like, why are the top four posts on like the the Trump forums that I follow about Meghan Markle? Like that's what fascinates me. Like in in an election year, we're talking about Meghan Markle, who will have likely very little interaction on the election uh, uh, and, and certainly doesn't play any major policy role in what we're doing. Yeah. Wiping my hard drive. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Want to do picks? Let's do it. Yeah. Uh, I got a, I got a quick the pick. Royals. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the Royal. Uh, no, I actually, uh, oh no, here I go. We, we got this. Uh, this is, this is, one uh talking about stuff that we're recently watching um or at least that was my weird things pick i also restarted watching uh the nbc comedy community again mm -hmm. uh community holds up um i it had been it had been such a long time since i actually watched it i don't i it must have been it must have been when that last season came out on Yahoo when I actually watched Community again. So this, so diving back into it, um, it was great. Community, Community is great. Hey, Community, that's a good show. I, I've, I'm finishing the last season with my girlfriend right now. This is the first time for us seeing it. First few episodes were rough. First few yeah. episodes, pilot episode, whatever. I'm like, where it, you, it starts off to be about one sort of thing. Uh, I was texting Jess. I'm like, what's the deal with the show? Why are people into it? And then once 
Harmon and co were able to do their crazy sort of stories and just really explore that world and those characters absolutely loved, loved it, loved it. Um, yeah. I will say though, it's funny to watch like Dan Harmon critical of other story structures when you're like, it's like there is one structure here and it's <laughs> enjoyable, but there is one like Rick and Morty after a while you realize, Oh, there's this, you know, the, there's three basically there, but it's, it's a, it's an enjoyable show. And I think that once it became more about the relationships, not specifically the characters, it became more fun. And yeah. so, but also but not he, like being overdrawn about that. Cause I think that's where, yeah. especially like really soapy sort of drama shows can, yeah. can lose it is they just all have the same characters and they're all just, you just got to put, take the, just put random people together now because that we can't add new people but we also have to use everybody. Like, um, I think that's also a nice thing about community is that it kind of keeps it pretty compact. Um, yeah, just the later seasons where you just watch names disappear from the opening crawl, uh, you know, and like, you know, Keith David's a good addition, you know, but you're like, uh, uh, yeah, it feels a little empty here. Yeah, <laughs> the Hulu, the Hulu um, image that they have because they have those full screen graphics on Hulu. It's like one of the la it's from the last season promo shot. So there's no Chevy and there's no Donald Glover on it. Um, uh, yeah. But uh, but yeah, community is really good. It's all on Hulu. Um, I, I think it's really cool. It's fun watching because, you know, talking about like, um, you know, the creator's voice, which you see a lot in Rick and Morty, especially of like take of, of having comments on genres of of films and TV. You, I, I'm still very early in community, but you see it really strong here too. Yeah. Uh, in terms of having having something to say about romantic comedies or TV writing and, and sitcoms and all that. And I get to make fun of my girlfriend because she took classes at the college it's based on. Oh really? Hey. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, hey, I got a TV pick. Uh, the final season, I believe, is airing now, but uh, my wife and I are catching up on season five of Shit's Creek. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, so season six, I guess, is debuting now. Uh, but man, I, I I know I've said it a million times. I think this has been my pick a bunch of times. Uh, that cast is just a murderer's row. Like, all four of those characters are so well-developed and you know, can just get laughs based on like looks and glances and stuff like that. But also it is just this in, in our age of a lot of sitcoms are kind of defined, especially post like Seinfeld sitcoms were often the edgy, well-written ones were like defined by characters making selfish moves, right. Or, or doing things that were, negative or bad or cheating or something like, like just showing like, like they're like good guys, but maybe they're bad guys. This show has consistently, and especially compared to Arrested Development, which is very much about selfish characters doing selfish things. Uh, it, it really, uh, I, I read in, uh, an interview with um, the guy who the, the, the show runner, uh, Eugene Levy's son, whose name I forget now, Dan Levy, Dan Levy. Uh, he was like, really, th this is a show about what if aliens showed up on Earth and learned to be Earthlings? And and you slowly realize that, like, yes, they are entitled, but they are good people, and they become better people, and they're slowly learning. And and it's that's uh, that, that's what I said. I think uh, may maybe when I when I tried to sell you on on the show, yeah. is yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. You know, conceptually, it's not very different from Arrested Development in terms of a rich family uh, having money tr troubles. Yeah. But unlike Arrested Development, where people either don't have any growth or have, uh, say, stunted uh, adult, uh, stunted development, uh, here all of the people tend to have have strengths um, and develop into better, more rounded characters instead of you know one dimensional, two dimensional. Uh, beings that are just kind of like uh, that that yeah. don't ever change. Uh, and and just Catherine O'Hara, I mean, a treasure. I'm just mm -hmm. very excited that a, a generation of people that maybe didn't see Best in Show, let alone you know Second City, hell, but might might not even know her as 
the Home Alone mom uh, just get to see her doing uh, of just a, a insane performance. Like she is just one of the funniest people who ever lived. Yeah. You know, uh, part of it's fascinating to me is how Dan Levy, who, you know, with him and his father, kind of the creative force behind this, like what I've seen of it is brilliant. And you're, you look at his INDB and there's not a lot of credits there. And he's obviously a guy that's been doing something for years because, and, and probably those genes don't hurt just, you know, the kind of the brilliance to getting from his, his, his parents. But, you know, it's just, that's the thing that's kind of fascinating to me is how, you know, yeah, out of nowhere. It, and, you know, initially you watch the series and you're like, OK, well, I'm watching this for Dan Levy or for, for Eugene Levy and for Catherine O'Hara because they're great together. They've been in all these other great stuff, uh, the, these things. But holy crap, Dan Levy and Annie Murphy, who plays his sister, are just insane. And and, and the, they, they get better and better uh, as uh, as 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 it goes along. But there are. Yeah, you know, the episode that we watched last night revolved around uh, the there's a, a baseball game uh, or a softball game, and uh, they need to fill out. Two people have gotten sick, and so the father and son, either of which are natural athletes, have to sub in on either side of of the uh, 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 the game. And it's just, it's like the in another world, it would almost be offensive. Where how much of the comedy is just gay Dan Levy not being into sports and not knowing what sports are and being upset that he has to be in there because so much of the comedy is just in another world. Like, I don't like running. What are sports like? Like, you know, I don't want to put on these shoes. Like, the, the does the glove match my hat? Like, uh. But because you love these characters so much and you love, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the relationship that he has with his boyfriend, like it, it, it is an insular comedy in a, in a way that isn't a, an exploitative comedy. And that's, that I think is, uh, I don't know. I, it, it's, it, it's, it's, it's rare and awesome. Andrew. Yeah, uh, yeah, but yeah, Chris Elliott is always great. There was an episode of Community where I see if there's a they show a photo of a character. I'm like, oh, it's Chris Elliott. And then a character appears. I'm like, oh, Mark Maron. It's Chris Elliott wearing like Mark Maron glasses. And oh, really? yeah, you think that it's like I'm like, we're like, oh, it's Mark Maron. I'm like, wow, wow. And then I'm like, wait, that was Chris Elliott. <laughs> God, <laughs> there is uh, just Chris Elliott, who's also just maybe I mean one of the funniest people ever. But there's a line in that episode we saw last night where. He's he. It's a running gag that he keeps switching his bet on who's gonna win the baseball game, and uh, at the end he's like, "Oh, I gotta change my bet again. I gotta call my bookie." And he calls his bookie, and it's just, uh, "Hi, honey, is your dad home?" <laughs> it's just that's just the line, but it just with his delivery is just so funny. There's just something about him that's just hilarious. He's, he's, we would uh, did a deep dive and was sending Justin clips from SNL and Letterman and stuff. Oh, of just no, uh, The old Letterman stuff. Like uh, At some point, someone's just going to compile a best of on YouTube and it'll dominate Twitter for a day because that yeah. stuff is just so good. It's amazing. Uh, my pick is going to be, I'm uh, reinforcing a pick before, been watching the toys that made us and enjoying the toys that made us. And uh, I, did I mention this before? How I'm watching an episode and some of the stuff they shoot these people in front of this window with this brick wall. And I'm like, man, that's like, that just feels so Burbank. It just feels so Burbank. And I look and I squint and I can see a Paquito Moss in the background. And next thing I look up Google Maps and there's the production office and it's like, you know, like, like a mile away. That's from there. <laughs> yeah, this just had a new season come out too, right? Yeah. The toys that made us? Yeah. yeah, they did. They did. Great. Movies that made us too is really good. Um, yeah. Oh, okay. You know, I would I would uh, encourage anybody to watch that. That the the style of stuff that they do with toys uh, is just great. Like making the narration an active part of the the the, the storytelling, and also like they, you know, and this was actually something that I, I took into Raise the Dead of just like understanding that you can like with toys that made us look they're telling a story about 
like there's a very boring business way to do that documentary, right? Like there's a very uh, by the numbers, like, oh, and then the sales happen, but they understand that the human drama matters and they pace their story out in a way to maximize that. And I think that it's, it's, it's exceptional. I mean, anybody who's like, uh, you can understand a lot of storytelling by just understanding why that show works compared to an average business documentary. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. It's solid. All right. It's been after. Boo. Boo, boo. Hey, that's the show. Cool. Uh, ready. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for weird things and after things. We're going to uh, take a quick break. We'll be back uh, an hour and a half. No. Yeah. We'll be back. We'll be back later with court we'll killers. Uh, we got uh, Hammond. Jay Hammond. Uh, is going to be on Cord Killers. That'll be fun. Uh, Justin, you already you already strum strum for the day. I strum it. I strum it today. But uh, yeah, tomorrow. I'll be back uh, tomorrow. Yeah, for the tomorrow. for the debates, the whole debates, right? Yeah, I'll be there in the morning. I'll be there in the night. Man, we're going to be having a good old time. Uh, Andrew, I know you're going to be writing a bunch. Everybody, buy a book. Buy an Maybe I won't book. just to prove you wrong. Oh, mm. I don't know. Mm. Uh, it's a. You're not the boss of me. Are nope. you the boss of me? Yeah. Are you the boss? Because uh, it's different. I, I think only in only in this specific instance. I believe. Uh, alrighty. Well, uh, thank you everybody for watching. We'll be back later with more stuff. Bye. Yay. See you.